Many years ago in Philadelphia, Albert E. N. Gray delivered a speech to a group of sales executives in which he defined the common denominator of success. He told his audience about the one factor present in every success story that has ever been written, and he gave in part the answer to one of the most perplexing questions of our time. Why, in a world where success is available to everyone, do so few succeed? His answer went something like this. Success is something achieved by the minority of men, and it is therefore unusual and not to be achieved by following our usual likes and dislikes, nor by being guided by our natural preferences and prejudices. In other words, success cannot be achieved by just doing what comes naturally. Gray then said that the common denominator of success is forming the habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. Let me repeat that. The common denominator of success, the determining factor in outstanding achievement of any kind, is forming the habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. What are these things? Well, they're the same things that you and I, even the most successful of us, don't like to do. In selling, for example, the list would include regular systematic prospecting, thorough preparation for each sales presentation, a definite program of study and self-improvement, and perhaps most important, making the best possible use of our time. How are successful people able to form the habit of doing these things regularly, while failures seldom do them at all, much less form the habit of doing them? The answer is quite simple. Successful people are influenced by the desire for pleasing results. Failures are influenced by the desire for pleasing activities. They're inclined to be satisfied with such results as can be obtained by doing things they like to do. Now, early in his career, the successful person forms the habit of planning his days in advance, sticking to that plan if possible, and getting the greatest good out of every available hour. I'm certain you'll agree that this isn't as easy as it sounds. There are distractions that tend to undermine even the best plans. There's often something we'd rather do than our work. Now, it would seem to be natural to yield to these distractions, to allow ourselves to get wrapped up in some unproductive activity. But remember, success is unusual and not to be achieved by following our usual likes and dislikes. The hours we spend on the job are devoted to many different acts. These acts can be grouped under one of two categories, goal achieving or tension relieving. Now, goal achieving acts are usually productive. In sales work, for example, prospecting, preparing for presentations, calling on clients and prospects, following up on sales, and studying for self-improvement all come under this heading. Under the heading Tension Relieving Acts are frequent coffee breaks, long unproductive lunch hours, and unnecessary conversation with people who are not connected with that job. Productive goal achieving acts lead to pleasing results, while unproductive tension relieving acts are merely pleasing activities and do nothing to move us forward. Of course, people need to relieve their tensions, too. They need coffee and lunches, but one of the secrets of success is knowing how to keep our unproductive time to a minimum while concentrating on those acts that are most productive and lead to pleasing results. We all know people who claim that a few hours a day is all they really need to put into their jobs in order to get along. Well, obviously, they're mistaken, and their mistake often costs them the success that could be theirs. There never has been, there is not now, and I don't believe there ever will be a time when a person can achieve anything outstanding by working only a few hours a day. Success doesn't come easily. It requires hard work and dedication and time. All of us have a tendency to waste time. Maybe it's because we don't realize that it's one of the few really precious things we've ever owned. Every day and every year, everyone starts out with exactly the same amount of time. The way people make use of their time shows up in the results they achieve. I have a neighbor who regularly spends quite a bit of time developing himself and his professional abilities. Where does he find the time? He finds a few minutes here, an hour there, and 20 minutes somewhere else. And when he finds it, he asks himself, what's the best thing I can do with this time? He takes every opportunity to learn more about his business and his career. He says it's as though he has the privilege of inviting into his mind the great authorities in any area he wants to explore. And these guests tell him how to get more out of living and more out of his work. With a choice like this, you couldn't pay my friend to go back to his old tension-relieving, time-wasting inactivity. Yes, time is available for us to use, and it's up to us whether we make a habit of using it wisely. One of the easiest ways to form the habit of making a wise use of time is to think for just a moment before we begin a new activity. Pause and think, now what kind of act is this to be? 
productive, goal achieving, or tension relieving. You might want to keep track just to see how you're measuring up. Do this often enough and the wise investment of time becomes a habit, the habit of acting in your own best interest. The common denominator of success is forming the habit of doing what failures don't like to do. And the thing failures dislike most is making the wisest possible use of time, one act at a time, all day long. Form this habit, and as William James put it, you will wake up one fine day to find you're among the competent ones of your generation. This early, as General Sherman said, war is hell. And anybody who's ever been close to one will agree with that. However, war or the prospect of war has motivated our scientific and technological people to some almost unbelievable achievements. Compare, for instance, our old World War II anti-aircraft guns with the new rocket-powered air defense missiles. As a young Marine in the Pacific Theater, I stood on the deck of the old battleship Arizona watching our anti-aircraft guns turn the sky black with airburst explosives. But I didn't see many hits. As a matter of fact, I didn't see one hit. Nowadays, though, we have computer-launched, rocket-powered, heat-attracted missiles. Once launched, these missiles home in on their prey, reacting to the target's engine heat. Being self-propelled, they track the enemy with deadly precision, and regardless of its speed or evasive action, almost always score a hit. Now, I see a parallel, and I think you will too, between the old and the new weapon systems and the way in which many of us operate. Take a salesperson, for example. Some salespeople, like the old anti-aircraft projectiles, aim at their target as best they can and proceed along a predetermined sales track. But if their target, the prospect, fails to perform as predicted, they miss the sale. And if they miss by an inch, they might as well miss by a mile. In selling, one doesn't get paid for near misses. Other salespeople, like the new heat-attracted missiles, sense the prospect's reactions and adjust to them. Personal interaction with the prospect guides their presentation. They can double back, change pace, or make other creative modifications necessary to close the sale. And the difference between these two types of people lies in what's been called empathy-ego balance. And it's applicable not only to salespeople, but to men and women in all areas of activity where persuasion and communication and leadership are important. David Meyer and Herbert M. Greenberg discussed this in the Harvard Business Review. I see empathy as the ability to imaginatively project ourselves into another person's situation, to stand in his shoes. The man who possesses great empathy can sense the feelings and reactions of others and can change course as the situation changes. The empathic person, for example, picks up an infinite variety of cues and clues about his listener's feelings and convictions. He is, in effect, experiencing these along with his listener. The person with little empathy functions like the old weapons. Once he launches into a subject, he follows a given course of action with little regard or awareness of the feelings of his listener. Now then, ego means self, as in self-restraint, self-respect, self-esteem. To understand this, we have to disregard the popular but inaccurate conception that equates ego with big-headedness or conceit. The ego we're talking about here is the mental picture a man has of himself and his ability. Ego provides the drive a person needs. It's his propulsion. His ego makes him want and need to succeed, not just for the money or merit to be gained, but for a deeper and more personal reason. His self-image improves dramatically with success and diminishes painfully with failure. Ego provides a strong competitive instinct to win every race every day, a will to win that triggers extra energy when extra effort is needed. Now, both empathy and ego are functions of the mind and powerful tools in any interpersonal situation. Best results are achieved with a strong balance of both empathy and ego. The key is balance. Let's go back to our sales example again and examine what happens when a salesperson's empathy-ego combination is not in balance. The one with lots of empathy but too little ego drive may be a fine person. He's a good guy and has many friends. You'd think he'd be a top producer, but he usually isn't. He gets along with the prospect, understands him, and frequently brings him near the close, but he lacks the ego drive to move the prospect that final inch to the sale. People like him, but too often end up buying from someone else. Now, just as inadequate as the salesperson with lots of ego drive, but too little empathy, he'll bulldoze his way through to some sales, but failing to understand his prospects, he misses many more. He forgets that a sales situation is not a contest where one person wins and the other loses, either both win together or both lose. 
So you see, the key is balance, that wonderful balance of a strong sales drive and a deeply empathic nature. Those who have cultivated this balance are invariably found at or near the top. So how is your empathy ego balance with the people you come in contact with every day? If a need for greater empathy is indicated, this is an attribute that can be developed with practice. You might recall the advice Atticus Finch gave his young daughter Scout in Harper Lee's great novel To Kill a Mockingbird. He said, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. Remember, everyone needs friendship, prestige, independence, achievement, and group membership. And in addition to these universal needs, each individual has his own particular interests and desires. Keeping his needs in mind will help you see things from his point of view, get a feeling of what's taking place inside his skin. Trust that feeling, act on it, and you'll find your empathy increasing with use and practice. To become stronger in the ego department, you might consider that all the great leaders are individualists with a healthy degree of self-esteem. Reasonable egotism is part of character and strength. Don't demean it in yourself or others. Reflect on what others have accomplished, men having no greater opportunity or personal resources than you now command. Your ego drive will increase with an increase in your knowledge of the range of accomplishments you can achieve. An improvement in your self-image, a raising of your goals, will open the door in the wall you may have unknowingly built around yourself by past performance, past environment, past thinking. The man or woman with a strong empathy ego balance is dynamic and self-reliant has endless drive and energy, and is concerned about other people and himself. He's mentally balanced to solve the problem, achieve the objective, hit the target. Such a person is a guided missile who's more wonderful than any scientific development man can ever dream of. And this kind of person is a great person to be with, or to be. This is Earl Nightingale, and thank you.